Dr. Saul for the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I really, when I turned on the news this morning and saw the Today Show and the, and the anchor from Dallas was trying to talk to Matt Lauer about what was going on, they said, what do you all have? And I felt very much at home. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to, to present some of the work from the American Academy, and I'm here really as a member of a team, an incredible team, that's working on, I think, some very exciting stuff. Uh, so on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Committee on Genetics, and the Genetics and Primary Care Institute, uh, let me get going here. The uh, initiatives in genetics within the American Academy of Pediatrics are the Committee on Genetics, which is a policy reviewing and setting uh, arm of the, of the uh, academy. There's a section on genetics and birth defects, which is really the advocacy uh, and what can we do to help uh, pediatric geneticist group. There's a division of, special, a division of children with special needs, and it's set up the Genetics and Primary Care Institute, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has now embarked on a specific uh, epigenetics training uh, initiative that I'll mention also. Uh, the Genetics and Primary Care Institute uh, is a cooperative agreement between the AAP and the HRSA and Maternal Child Health Bureau Genetic Services Branch started. It's a three-year project, started in 2011 and through uh, May of 2014, so we're uh, a little over halfway through it. Uh, the vision of this uh, project was to improve primary care provider uh, knowledge and provision of genetic medicine, recognizing that this is a significant hurdle. As we've already talked about today, we can talk about a variety of things, but how do we get this out to the field, out of academic centers, where people are providing primary care, and that's one of our primary goals. American Academy of Pediatrics has over 60,000 members uh, na nationwide. The three goals of the GPTI, uh, one was to utilize uh, quality improvement science to develop a change package for the improvement, uh, excuse me, improved provision of genetic related services. And this is, those of you, for, the American Academy of Pediatrics has this incredible network uh, called the Quinn Network, Quality Improvement Innovation Network. They have over 300 pediatric practices around the country that have told the Academy when something new and different is coming up that we think will make a difference in children's care, we want to be a part of it. Uh, so those practices then, as these projects then come down the pike, are solicited to participate in these projects. I happen to be a uh, subject matter expert uh, in one of those on the uh, act sheets uh, for the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and we're now starting one for genetics and primary care. It's exciting to see what's happening with uh, those people, and actually I'm gonna give you the, some of the results of a survey that a good number of those Quinn providers that, uh, participated in that I think will be useful for you to, in terms of trying to understand the obstacles that we deal with. Goal two was to set up a technical assistance center to address systems and policies, and one component of that was a colloquium on genetics, literacy, and primary care, and I'm gonna show you some of the results from that. And then goal three was the easy one, to embed the practice of genetic medicine in, into the future of primary care workforce. Obviously not the easy one, uh, but uh, it's the one that we're now is just starting to get going after we've sort of got goals one and two off the ground, so we're gonna be working hard, hard on this one. And, and as I said, we have significant partners uh, not just within the Academy of Pediatrics, but we have significant partners uh, in this room, in this endeavor. Um, so we, we sent out a survey to the over the 80, excuse me, over 300 members of the Quinn Project and 88 respondents, so about 29%. We think it was, that was pretty good. Uh, and we're going to be doing a periodic, excuse me, a periodic survey of AAP fellows um, in late 2013. The needs assessment in uh, February of 2012 was really done because, okay, if we're going to be setting up this Quinn project in terms of what needs to be done in terms of getting genetics into primary care medicine, let's sort of establish a baseline of what are the needs. This is a reasonably unscientific survey. Uh, it was sent out to, us, to a, a group of more motivated individuals, but I think still gives you useful information. So there were the 88 providers, 29%. It was an online 39% uh, 
uh, excuse me, online 43 item survey. Taking a family history is important, 100%. I gather a three generation family history, less than a third. Um, how do you usually collect a family health history from your patients? I usually ask a question like, do any diseases run in your family? Uh, and you can see the other things. They, some, whoops, some had a standard checklist. Uh, some asked specific health uh, questions about uh, specific family members. And there was a, 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 a couple who fessed up and said, I don't get a family history. <laughs> When they did inquire about the health of family members, over 90% inquired about the siblings, parents, and grandparents. But only half asked about aunts or uncles, uh, less than that about nieces and nephews, and uh, around that, uh, excuse me, uh, less than a third about cousins. And the information that was least likely to be collected was about age of the family members in terms of the problems they were affected with, consanguinity, and ethnic background, things which we might consider important for certain disease problems that we're, that we're looking into. Now this is a very interesting slide. 86% order three or less genetic tests per year. And again, we consider this to be a fairly motivated group of, of pediatricians. 13% discuss with patients uh, their risks, benefits, and limitations of the test in question. Only less than five, excuse me, they refer less than five patients a year to a geneticist. But of that group, 90% have access to a genetic professional and 75% have genetic professionals within 30 miles. Now you can look at that one way or the other. That says 25% don't have a genetic professional within 30 miles and might consider that to be a geographic obstacle. 83% uh, feel like they have a system in place for genetic referrals. Uh, that again, that's self. Uh, and there was moderate to low awareness of national resources, but overwhelmingly uh, they had not been utilized or perceived as useful. Out of the, of, excuse me, of the 12 national genetic resources that were asked on the service, uh, survey, less than 50% were aware of the act sheets that were previously mentioned uh, in terms of the newborn screening project. About half said that they felt competent in providing genetic medicine. Uh, but now what's interesting is you might think, well, that was because they trained more recently or the number of tests they ordered uh, was somehow correlated, did not. Um, 30, excuse me, of the 65% of, 63% of the respondents with an EHR, 65% reported ability to easily and efficiently, cap, efficiently capture the information as fair to poor. So two thirds say it ain't working. <laughs> now, a very interesting slide. How would you, in, what would you incentivize, to more, incentivize you to more effectively integrate genetic based medicine into your practice? Increased understanding of genetics, which I think translates to education. Um, CME in, ed in genetics. Reimbursement um, was up, up there. Uh, a more comprehensive medical home. And again, we're trying to integrate this whole concept of genetics and primary care medicine into a more aggressive medical home model within uh, four pediatricians. So again, this was, a sur this was a select survey. One could argue these results are skewed. Uh, since this group was more motivated and knowledgeable, uh, yet in general, they provided, reported few interactions with genetic patients, at least those they, re they referred or ordered testing on, uh, had wide variability and expressed, and expressed some discomfort in genetic medicine, acknowledging a need for the increased awareness, understanding, and the education uh, sources that they need. Associated with that, just recently, we've looked at some stakeholder interviews. Uh, we've identified uh, uh, seven, uh, we've conducted seven in-depth inter interviews with key project stakeholders and experts to look at, again, the barriers uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, 
And again, our, this sampling was just our perception of folks that we felt like we needed to talk to, so they were identified within the American Academy of Pediatrics. Extensive interviews over the phone, lasting close to an hour. Um, covering a wide variety of topics. What do they, these people think need to be done? What are the barriers? What can we do? And what are the actionable items going forward? Uh, the reports. Uh, PCPs lack knowledge and comfort with genetics. There's a lack of fundamental knowledge about what things mean and what to do, and uncertain of where to turn for for specialty help. As a pediatric geneticist, this is sort of disconcerting uh, because other pe I don't perceive this when I deal with other pediatric specialists. I don't perceive this when I deal with pediatric endocrinologists. I don't perceive this when I deal with pediatric nephrologists. Now, I might not feel as comfortable, but I don't feel like I have a, there's a, this barrier with a moat and a drawbridge and a portcullis uh, that keeping me, keeping me out of the castle. Uh, no time to incorporate into practice. Lack of education is a concern. Uh, low accessibility of genetic counselors and specialties. Again, this is from the stakeholder interviews. Lack of involvement of PCPs in genetic projects and initiatives. Lack of knowledge of what is reimbursed. Quote, I don't know what tests are covered and which ones are not. Some of these tests run into the hundreds, even thousands of dollars. And I don't know what I should order and what I shouldn't, what it's going to cost the family and all that stuff. And again, I, I, as, a, as a pediatric geneticist, I understand some of this. And maybe it's because genetics has sort of evolved in my lifetime and some of the other specialties were already there. But I know to order tests in other specialties are very expensive. Uh, and I don't know everything that's going to be covered. Uh, but I don't feel that it's this standoffish. So what were the key competencies? <laughs> Understanding of what? tests are needed, understanding of when, understanding the significance, what to do when tests come back negative. That's always the big bugaboo. Just because they're normal doesn't mean that rules things out, which is what a lot of families think. Phew, okay, we're good. That was, that was negative. Uh, when to refer, what to refer, how to communicate, and how to coordinate uh, this complex care. Um, so what, are they, what was from the stakeholders then what was suggested in terms of moving genetics and primary care forward? Increasing provider education and training. Uh, and again, that gets much to the three goals of the Genetics and Primary Care uh, Institute. Evidence to support genetics and primary care uh, is important and does impact outcomes for families. Better ways to collect and store family history improve care coordination, increasing genetics information on board examinations, which we got into a little bit this morning in terms of certification, and incorporating genetics into continuing medical education. Um, the impact of low genetic literacy, according to the stakeholders, uh, was that uh, the problems with uh, a good number of pediatricians prefer not to manage uh, newborn screening issues, and some of those are certainly very manageable in coordination with a genetic specialist, whereas sometimes they would just rather take a hands-off approach. Uh, providers are not aware of their role in testing or treatment advances with regard to molecular genetic testing. Now what's interesting, this slide is to remind me, when I polled my own pediatric genetic colleagues, and say, what do you think the barriers are? This is my shorthand for basically saying they're the same things that the primary care providers say, uh, and, and they're, they're not different. Uh, but sometimes I think we look at the solutions uh, differently, and we have a tough time maintaining the context of what's out there in primary care. So one of the roles of the Genetics and Primary Care Institute was establishing a colloquium, which was held in October of this past year, was looking at genetic literacy, literacy in primary care and trying to look at how uh, we can be looking at the knowledge base and awareness of genetic literacy in the medical home. Uh, we developed an overarching consensus statement, which we have copies of here somewhere, I think, uh, which can be distributed, which you're welcome to, but it is embargoed. Um, uh, that, we will, that I will go with you here. 
yeah, it, it will melt as soon as you walk out the door. <laughs> uh, we, we had uh, speakers and content experts uh, from around and some of the folks from this room uh, in looking at the issues of family history, looking at genomics, genetic literacy, epigenetics, and primary care and genetics, and invited guests from a wide range of partners. Um, and uh, to try to make sure we had a, a reasonable consensus about the issues that we were doing. This was a very lively uh, discussion over a day and a half in tropical Chicago. <laughs> um, and we, the, the, I will spend a little bit of time going through this consensus statement with you because I think this is sort of a blueprint for us in terms of going forward. Blueprint for us, I think, maybe is something that uh, this, in, this group would like to look at also uh, as terms of how we would uh, recommend going forward in some of the ways. The purpose of that one and a half day meeting in Chicago was not to all get together and have all the answers. Uh, the pr purpose of that meeting was to try to set forth a blueprint going forward that we could recommend. And we basically then had four things, and let me just skip through here. One, define how pediatric primary care providers should use genetics and genomics in practice. Two, define, develop, and provide the tools and resources then that are needed to integrate genetics and genomics into primary care. Three, integrate genetics and genomics into primary care training at all levels. And then four, provide an evidence base for optimal integration in genetics and genomics into primary care, i.e. the more research-oriented component of this. So let me go back through these then. Uh, in terms of primary care providers, recognizing that primary care providers are already using genetics and genomics. In some ways, maybe they don't even know it. And so but what's needed is an evolutionary process, not a revolutionary change. And this was a big, to me, this was a big deal coming out of the meeting. We use the term genetic revolution, and I think in many ways we've turned off our colleagues. Uh, they, it's, it's, it sounds more than I can get my arms around. Uh, and so we're basically just asking them to evolve using a lot of things they're already doing. A lot of them are getting family has history information. Maybe they're not getting that gold standard three generation pedigree that we think they do, but they, need, they are already getting it. Um, approach primary care using the framework of a medical home model. Uh, the genetics and genomics can augment and strengthen this. It's not separate. It's all part of the same thing and emphasize the development of competencies as Bruce was talking about, not knowledge, uh, but competencies, uh, that have, and many of which have already been incorporated into tra training, but just need to be tweaked. Okay, and then looking at the tools and resources, emphasizing the relative values of targeted family histories. Oftentimes, if a p physician only has that 10 minute interview with somebody, He's not, he or she is not going to be able to get the three-generation pedigree, but they can at least get targeted information that might be very pertinent to that, to that child's care and potentially other family members. Providing the tools to do that. Uh, encouraging the point of care uh, support tools that are out there for genetics and genomics. Creating those, creating those tools uh, for the use uh, and interpretation. Providing patient and family education and support tools that are culturally sensitive and literacy and language appropriate. Uh, and then facilitating access for families to family support uh, and advocacy, a strong component that needs to be integrated into primary care, not just what genetics, uh, geneticists provide when they see families. And in many ways, pediatricians and primary care physicians are this is, they're hardwired for a lot of this family support and advocacy, and we should provide the appropriate tools to help them from a genetic standpoint. Uh, integrate genetics into genomics into primary care training. This is the educational component then, uh, identifying the fundamental concepts that do need to be learned uh, and integrated, but then uh, trying to incorporate genetics into genomics into the competencies recognizing that genetics and genomics educational efforts must span the entire educational curriculum. And Bruce showed you the genetics vector from pre-professional from pre to uh, the uh, CME and MOC 
Uh, and I like the diagram that uh, Tom Nasca had earlier about the, the uh, going up, except I th that seems to be a loop that I continually drop down to the bottom of uh, and, then need to, and then need to work my way back up. Um, and then um, looking at what we're going to do in a critical way, uh, developing the, uh, identifying the gaps, uh, filling some of those gaps, uh, looking at what we did, did we, did we really fill the gaps as we said we had hoped to? Um, and then look at what infrastructure is really needed to facilitate uh, the filling the gaps and the research uh, components to, for this. So that was the uh, colloquium, which we think was a reasonable blueprint, for, and a lot of those things will be picked up by the Genetics and Primary Care Institute. This will be published uh, the colloquium, the papers, and the consensus statement will hopefully be published in, within the next two to four months. Uh, we're working on the manuscripts now. Uh, it will be an electronic supplement to pediatrics, we hope, uh, and we hope it will be of some benefit uh, to the genetics community and the primary care community. One of the other things we're doing, um, the genetics and primary care, as so I said, they're setting up a uh, technical assistance center. The website will be up, geneticsandprimarycare.org should be up within a week or two. We did have educational webinars. Uh, we had a series of 10, um, and I think I'd address that in the next slide, uh, that, were, that we thought were, were quite good and were very helpful, uh, but uh, we are gonna be taking more information out of that and going forward, looking at whatever vetted tools and strategies that are out there, and trying to, again, use the strength of the American Academy of Pediatrics in terms of rolling this into the tools for primary care uh, providers. We have a significant partner with NichePeg uh, in terms of developing a family history tool for pediatric providers that is sort of a uh, next iteration of a, a similar tool that's been set up for uh, prenatal care providers, uh, and, uh, but it's different, uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, and that's currently in development with a very short timeline and a lot of members uh, around the table here are parts of that group. Uh, and then looking at residency training initiatives. The educational webinars, we had a series of 10. Uh, we didn't have thousands, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, meeting with us, uh, but we had, they were well received, uh, on a, done on a very short notice. There were two to 300 folks. Uh, it was not CME. We purposely set it up, if you will, without CME, just a half hour. Um, and uh, we, they, they are archived on the website right now if you're interested. The organization for the 10 talks uh, was developed from a manual, which I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, and fact sheets are now being developed from these webinars that will be posted to uh, the genetics and primary care website that we hope, again, will be of some benefit to primary care providers that want more additional information. Uh, in could this be a template for collaborative efforts with other professional societies and other educational efforts? I'd like to think so, uh, but time will tell. Um, the, again, the AAP's uh, newest strategic planning priority is genetics, genomics, and epigenetics. AAP has what are called mega issues, uh, every, uh, usually every year, but sometimes they will skip a year. They've been on early brain and childhood development. They've been on childhood obesity. They've been on foster care. Uh, the current one, I think, is going to be on, the next one, I think, is going to be on anesthetic use uh, in children. So they identify what they consider to be a mega issue, spend about six to 12 months reviewing the aspects, and then, sp then putting the appropriate time, energy, and money and resources into figuring out how this can be brought to the next level of primary care. In some way, it was actually called uh, just epigenetics. We've argued that it really, what you're really talking about is integrating more genetics, more genomics, and epigenetics uh, into, uh, the, uh, pr into primary care medicine. There is a CME conference uh, that's been funded called Dive Into the Gene Pool. Uh, integrating genetics and genomics into your primary care practice that will be in August, a two-day conference with a, a for primary care providers. 
I just realized one slide was missing, uh, and let me just mention that briefly. The, um, I, as part of this, I was, as part of the instructions, I was asked to look up sort of what the certifying bodies are doing in terms of genetics. And I looked up on the American Board of Pediatrics website uh, in, under the certifying examination what's asked for in terms of genetics. And Roman numeral seven tells me what needs to be done, but it's basically the, the deficiency in my mind is its knowledge, it's, it's specifically knowledge based, and it's recognize dot, 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 or understand dot, 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 uh, about list of about 40 or 50 different things. I think we need to work much harder on that in terms of integrate, trying to change that. Uh, and if you look up the, uh, the past RRC requirements for pediatrics uh, in terms of genetics, to my mind, they are woefully inadequate um, and uh, need a lot of help. But as Mira said, you, you, as everyone says, well, you know, if we put more genetics, we're going to have to take out nephrology and this and that. I think the point is it can be integrated without making it a false choice. Um, the, American, the, uh, the Committee on Genetics is putting out a new manual, uh, Medical Genetics in, in Pediatric Practice, which will hopefully be available in spring of 2013. I was hogtied uh, to be the editor, um, and uh, it'll. Are you from, if, those of you familiar with the Red Book in pediatrics uh, for infectious disease, please don't think this will be anything similar to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's our first iteration. It's our first shot at this, and we hope it's a, we hope it's of, of some benefit to uh, primary care pediatrics, which is uh, which is our audience. Um, and a, command, a companion mobile app uh, is also develop, developing using a lot of the tables and algorithms uh, from this book. Uh, the Committee on Genetics is working on various policy statements, uh, or has recently published various policy statements. You see here Down syndrome, Fragile X, Prater Willy, uh, and is working on policy statements on ethical issues for genetic testing, which actually is, I think, is almost published. Um, it's a, that's a collaborative uh, effort with, from, with the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, which I should applaud both organizations. Uh, it's unbelievable <laughs> what the machinations that had to, be, had to go through for that, but it really it looks like it's going to be a great statement that both organizations can share. Uh, looking at the clinical genetic evaluation of a child with intellectual disability or developmental delay, Marfan syndrome, prenatal screening and diagnosis, so we're always looking at things that we need to be adding. Um, the section on genetics and birth defects, which again is the folks that are sort of self-identified geneticists within the AAP, um, um, takes care of educational program at the AAP's annual conference uh, in, the, in the fall, looks at genetic-related topics in the, in the AAP newsletter, uh, supports genetics-related content in a variety of uh, AAP publications, and also now has a listserv for uh, sharing content uh, and open forum discussion group, which has really taken off substantially. It was a great talk, um, Bob. I just actually have one comment and one question. The comment is that I heard now two talks in a row that um, people weren't giving CME for these webinars or these short things because it's too difficult. Um, I'm sorry that Murray left, but full disclosure, I sit on the board of the ACCME, so if people want... Oh, sorry. So if people want to drop me an email about exactly why it's difficult, um, I'm happy to pass that along because it really shouldn't be. We need to, from the ACCME side, make this easier. Um, but the question for you, Bob, is um, the residency training initiatives that you had listed, um, is, are those at specific programs? Is a template being developed or something? That's, that's all at our, at our project advisory committee meeting in December. We started discussing putting spaghetti on the wall. We haven't sorted it into meatballs yet. All right, Heidi. 
Actually, just drawing on Mira's comment, um, you know, I observed that same comment about it being challenging to deal with CME, you know, uh, administrative issues. And I, Harvard has had a program over the last few years to develop um, CME modules in genetics and genomics. And I wrote one on cardiomyopathy a few years ago, and it was reasonably straightforward. And then the next one in, in hearing loss and Usher syndrome, a lot more rules had been put into place uh, before you could put one of these on. And they came back to us and said, you have to do this very extensive analysis of, you know, gap, practice gaps, and basically the end result was it took two and a half years for me to get this module to do all of this sort of administrative work after we'd already written the CME module itself. And, you know, I basically, at the end of the process, vowed I was never going to write another one of these things again. But at the same time, it's not to say that the work they asked us to do was not important. You know, identifying practice gaps is important as you think about implementing CME programs. But I guess the question is, what's the right combination of people to deal with these, because I didn't feel like I was an expert in identifying practice gaps, but maybe I was an expert in genetic basis of hearing loss. And so how can we better support an infrastructure to get the expertise of individuals in specialties, but support them in perhaps the research administrative process for dealing with identifying practice gaps and, and that sort of thing. And, and I don't know if Mira can also comment on how to just make this easier because, you know, at that point I was, I was done with those sorts of things. Well, just to answer that, I know it's difficult. Um, but um, any new knowledge is an automatic gap. You just have to be able to, to to say that and verbalize that, but new technology, new knowledge is an automatic practice gap. Um, so I think sometimes we get caught up with a lot of the logistics, but it shouldn't be as hard as it is. We can figure it out. Okay, we have Bruce, Deborah, Mark, and Jean. So Bruce. Bob, I wonder if a specific issue came up in your survey, and that is that Pediatricians, for all of their professed lack of familiarity with genetics, in fact, have been using genetics, as you pointed out. But one of the pitfalls is that it has changed a lot in the past few years. And for example, many children they may follow who had genetics evaluations that did not result in a diagnosis, or for that matter, had a diagnosis that was untreatable, now, in fact, may be faced with the possibility of either achieving a diagnosis or instituting a treatment that didn't exist a couple of years back. So it's a moving target. And I wonder if there was a, a cognizance of the paradigms they were used to no longer apply and some of the same children that had been the subject of evaluations actually should be the subject of repeat evaluations now. Yeah, I mean, that wasn't specifically asked in that, in that survey. I think that's something when we do the survey in the fall to the AAP membership as a whole definitely needs to be looked at. And that's a, that's a significant point you've brought up before that we need to be sure we're integrating into our educational component of the GPCI. You're right. I mean, people just say, well, they, I saw, they saw them three, three or five years ago. They didn't say anything that was, that was helpful. Let's forget it. Great. Deborah. So I, I, there is one statement that you made which absolutely rang true with what happened in the College of American Pathologists, is that genetics and genomics is not a revolution. It's an evolution. Our knowledge and understanding of the information that can be applied to clinical practice is going to evolve over time, and we found that to be a statement that we need to emphasize over and over and over again with pathologists so they don't just get scared and are like a deer in the headlight, you know. So that, that rang very true. And we have, that was sort of brought forward in the meeting because we have a very strong pediatrician who sort of is very involved with genetics, but he's, again, he just practices pediatrics day in, day out. And he was quite offended with the term revolution. He said, you were already doing this. Let's, let's make sure we understand what we're, what we're talking about here. Great. Um, we had Mark and Jean. And Wolfgang, did you have your hand up as well? Or no? You did? Did you have your hand up as well? Yes. Okay. And Wolfgang. So, Mark. I've got turned off already. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, uh, the GCPI has done a great job of doing a needs assessment, as we've heard about. I'm interested, Bob, if you can pr provide some perspective in terms of how you think AAP as a whole will take 
what was developed from the needs assessment and actually translate that into a uh, product uh, beyond what the GCPI itself has done uh, uh, to really uh, make sure that we close that need or that gap? Um, a great question, and, and the answer is I don't know, they don't know, but the, uh, I think the fact that they've identified the strategic planning initiative and something going f that almost will essentially follow in essentially 2013, 2014, if GCPI goes away, uh, how it will be integrated into genetics, I think would be something that they would take on because again, in the strategic planning and issues that they do, they devote a significant amount of resources, that is people and money, to, to keep these things going. So it's a, really a question of sustainability then beyond the specific the, target. Right. Okay. Uh, Jean? Thank you so much for sharing the resources that are coming available. And I just wanted to share with all of you, as you create these resources and have webinars or PowerPoints or even website links, that those kind of things can be shared through outreach on G2C2 and have greater opportunity to reach out to various healthcare providers. So uh, take the opportunity to look at G2C2 and see if that might be something appropriate for your resources to list. Thank you. And, Thank you. And Jean, for those who may not know what G2C2 is, if there's anyone, um, uh, I'm maybe sure just are. one sentence on what it is and where it's found. Yeah, G2C2 is the Genetics Genomics Competency Center that Dr. Green referred to in his opening remarks. And if you even just plug G2C2 into your um, browser, it'll pop up. It's a learning repository that's been created for um, primarily educators, but also now the practicing um, discipline members, so uh, take the opportunity to look at that. I'd be glad to talk about it more. Thank you. Thanks. And last comment, Wolfgang. Um, I just wanted to reemphasize uh, the point you brought up about the gap of the gap of knowledge. Um, I think for those who are in the implementation and the teaching of genomics, it is really also essential to bring this back. Otherwise, inflation, information flows only one way. I'm more coming from the functional genomics side, and I know how much um, ambiguity is in the data, and actually also how, mon how many results are false or later proven false. So it's a very important function that I think everybody here should uh, implement as well, and you had it um, formalized there, that the gap of knowledge should be identified for those who teach and implement and then bring it back to the community. It's not a one-way flow. And one of the things, again, the pediatricians that we've talked to through this process have said, pediatricians, at least, are used to dealing with ambiguous data uh, and trying to help parents deal with that. We just need to make them more comfortable from the, from the genetic standpoint. All right. Thank you very much. So next.